Okay, so today we're going to talk about color theory, uh, and then we're also going to spend a fair amount of time working on your Charlie Harper image, which is due a week from today, um, on Monday. And so I want to spend plenty of time going through that. I'll show you some sample images today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some other techniques that you might use on Wednesday, but you can certainly get the bulk of the Charlie Harper drawing started uh, with the pen tool. You have the pen tool skills now uh, to do it, and today we'll talk about color choice and, and how you go about choosing which colors you're going to use, um, etc. So we continue moving right along. We've already, you know, as of today, we're at 18 days through the semester of 31-ish, depending on how it all plays out with holidays and whatever. So we're cruising right along. Okay, so in terms of color theory, uh, there's no way for me to actually distill this all down uh, in a, in a thorough manner in one class period because we could spend the whole semester talking about color theory and, and really understanding it. But I want to give you the basics so that we can at least have a dialogue about it and you can understand that what color you choose actually matters. Um, and so if it's something that you're more interested in, there's plenty of um, you know, YouTube videos that explain more about color theory and, and that sort of thing. So we're giving you the broad overview uh, today. So we're going to start with something called the color wheel, which you probably played around with when you were in elementary school, uh, mixing various paints together and that sort of thing. Uh, same thing applies today. We have our primary colors, our red, our blue, and our yellow. Then we have secondary colors, which are orange, green, and purple, which is basically right in between the primary colors. So the primary colors are uh, on this little diagram have a P next to them. So we have yellow, we have red, and we have blue. In between those, right? We get the secondary colors, the oranges, the greens, and the purples. In this case, they're calling it violet, but same thing, right? And then we have the tertiary colors, which are the ones in between the primaries and the secondaries, right? And we could keep breaking the color wheel down further and further as, as we got um, further. Now, we have something else called complementary colors. You're probably already aware of this as well. And that is that there are colors that go well together. Right? They complement each other because they're exactly opposite each other on the color wheel. So the complement of yellow would be purple. Right? The complement of blue would be orange. You get the idea. Okay? Uh, complement of red would be green. Right? Analogous colors are colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. Right? They match each other quite well, but they don't have a lot of contrast if you use them together. Right? So if we look at this set that's been pulled out of analogous colors, Right? If we look at these three colors, there's just not a lot of difference between them. They're all kind of a yellowy orange. Right? They're all in the, kind of the same tone, though, so they go well together because they're all kind of similar, but they don't have a big contrast or a big focal point uh, established with them. So we have two different color systems that we use to represent colors. One is RGB and one is CMYK. And when you open an InDesign document or you open an Illustrator document, you're presented with a choice of do you want an RGB color scheme or do you want a CMYK color, uh, color scheme. These are the two, and there's a difference. So RGB is based on a light system. So things that illuminate or things that are, are projecting color like your projector, like your computer screen, like your phone, like your TV, anything like that, or most everything like that, is produced by mixing colors together. right? So it's an additive process, meaning if we combine red light and green light, we end up with yellow light. Right? Anybody ever been to the Exploratorium in San Francisco? They have a great exhibit of this where they have these lights that are shining, and you can stand in front, and you can see if you block a certain light, the shadows come together, and you can see, oh, it makes this color. right? Same concept uh, as, as what's happening on your monitors, et cetera. Uh, so this color scheme is based on light, and it's based on the mixing of the values of color. Right? The opposite of that is called CMYK, right? and this is what we print with. So these are inks, these are toners coming out of a laser printer, something like that. And they work differently than the additive system of light. In this case, each of these dyes absorbs all the colors of the spectrum except the one right, that it is. Right? So if we take cyan, for example, right, we have cyan printed on a piece of paper or something. Right? Light is shining on it. 
the theoretically white light is shining on it, which is the mixture of all the colors. Right? If we go back to the light system, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. Right? Mixture of all the colors is white. So we have white light shining on the cyan. Right? The cyan is then absorbing everything except for the cyan color, which is then reflected back at us. Okay? So if we have a CMYK system, it has to do with the absorption of color rather than adding light together. Right? So when we, when we combine cyan, magenta, and yellow, we get black. A lot of times, we also have black as well as a toner. Um, and so that black color is called key, or just black. That's where we get the CMYK. That's the black. But if you add them all together, you can also get black. If you've ever printed on um, the color laser printers and found that your black really isn't black, it's probably because it's combining the colors together rather than using the, the actual black toner. Um, and so there's different strategies for how you fix that problem. But it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class. Okay? So those are two different color theories or color schemes that we use very frequently. As we continue, right, we want to talk about the color theory. Right? So why are we using a particular color? Generally speaking, there's meaning behind whatever color we're picking or we're intending it to convey. And it's something that is subtly programmed into our brains to recognize, but it's not something that's overtly on the surface of what we're doing. Right? So it's just it's that little bit that's kind of behind the scenes that's controlling. And you will see through a variety of examples today that good marketing campaigns, good companies use this to their advantage. And there's no reason you shouldn't too. Right? You want to be deliberate when you choose the colors that you choose. You want to make sure that they go together. You want to make sure that they have good meaning behind them. Right? If you do all of that, your work will stand out uh, and be that much better. So generally, there's, there's groups of color, right? and then there's specific colors. And we'll talk about the groups first, and then we'll get into the specific colors. I'm not going to go through every color, but I'll go through a lot of the big ones. Okay? So the, the color groups are based on emotion. There are warm colors, there are cool colors, right? and there are neutral colors. So the warm colors, not a surprise, are the reds, the yellows, the oranges. Right? Those evoke warmth. If you think of fire or something like that, chances are you think of the warm colors. Right? They're often associated with feelings of happiness or joy or excitement, those kinds of things. Uh, and in two, for example, in 2009, you guys probably remember back that far. I'm not dating myself too badly. Right? It's not that long ago. Uh, there was a lot of struggling websites when the, the, kind of the first dot com well, I guess it would be the second wave of dot-coms burst. Um, and they shifted their website color schemes to include yellow right, as a warm, happy color. Right? And I'll show you some examples of this later on. Okay? Cool colors are the opposite. The blues, the greens, and the purples, um, they don't have to be cold. They just a lot of times um, come across as professional, uh, established, something that's going to stick around for a while. Right, solid, uh, and so you can you can see that specifically. Then we get to neutral colors, which are the grays, the browns, the blacks, and the whites. Right, they tend not to have too much emotion to them. Though you've probably heard people talk about warm grays or cool grays before. Right, that just means that they're the if you take the basic set of grays and you shift them a little bit more to the yellow orange, or you shift them a little bit more to the blue, they become warmer or cooler depending on how far you go in that direction. The idea, though, behind a neutral color is that it's not really intended to evoke major emotion. Um, so that's the purpose of them. Red, if we go to specific colors, right? red is symbolic of fire or power. It's often associated with passion and importance. Right? It stimulates energy or excitement. Right? The negative connotations would be anger rage, emergency, those kinds of things. Right? So when you're thinking about designing something and you want to use red, you want to think about what the purpose of the red is. Right? It's a very bold color, and it tends to stand out a lot. Right? So passion, importance, right? that sort of thing. When I did my thesis, uh, I picked one accent color, and a lot of us did in our thesis. Um, and that accent color varied person to person. I picked red. Um, and I was using it primarily because of the importance um, clause here. It's something that draws attention. It's something that focuses you on something. And so on all of my drawings, right, recognizing I had 24 feet of drawings on the wall, 
every drawing had a little bit of red in it. Not too much red, just a little bit, because it was identifying a really key component of that particular drawing. So you want to think about how you're using the color uh, and what does it do for you. Right? Orange is often associated with happiness or joy or sunshine. Right? It evokes a childlike exuberance. That's out of the color theory book. Right? The negative connotations, it's still a little bit on the aggressive side. Uh, sometimes it can be symbolic of ignorance right, or deceit. Yellow is, tends to be the, quote, happiest color. Uh, we're programmed with this from a very early age when we draw our sons yellow. Right? Um, I, I can see this in my daughter's drawings. Right? She likes yellow because it's that happy color. Right? Um, and so that's something to be aware of. And if you can use it to your advantage, why not? Okay? Joy, intelligence, brightness, energy, optimism, those kinds of things. Right? Negatives, it still could be a little bit of the caution. Right? There's a reason we use caution tape as yellow. Right? They just repainted the drain out there, which is hideously ugly. But it certainly draws your attention to caution. Right? Now, I don't know why they did it, but it's just it's horrible. Anyway, side note. Right? Um, criticism, laziness, jealousy uh, also can be there. Green. Right, symbolic of nature and has a healing quality, right, associated with growth and harmony, harmony as well as nature, right, also can be symbolic of money. So we had this really interesting trend where um, we started to get environmentally conscious, or I guess we still are trying to be environmentally conscious, and we had this whole thing about going green and everything's green, and, and green became this, uh, even though it's a color, it became this synonym with being environmentally happy and whatever. So we had this outpouring of product stuff that was all printed in green. The logos are printed in green now. Right? It's a very dominant um, color because of the current culture of us. Right? So if all you have to do is print your label in green and everybody thinks your stuff is better than somebody else's, right? why wouldn't you switch your logos to being green? Right? Does that make sense? So it's a psychological thing that happens. Um, symbolic of money, if you go to a lot of financial websites, uh, they have some elements of green on them. Right? Online shopping tends to have green pieces. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. It can also be used for a beginner or lack of experience. That's very common as well. Blue tends to be peaceful and calming. Uh, it's stability or expertise. Right? It's used in big corporations. If you go to whitehouse.gov, guess what? It's blue. Right? It's stable. That's why they use blue. Right? It's trust, dependability, that sort of thing. Right? Negative, it could be a little bit of coldness, right? passiveness, that sort of thing. Uh, but generally, it's about that establishment. Purple is the color of royalty or sophistication. It shows, shows wealth or luxury. And I'll show you some good examples of how companies use purple um, to do this. Uh, it can be associated with healing or the feminine qualities, et cetera. Um, and it can also exude a gloominess or a sadness, right? depending on how it's used. Black. While not really a color in the normal sense, right, tends to be correlated with power or elegance or sophistication. There's a reason that we call fancy, fancy dress things black tie events, right? It's a sophistication, it's a fanciness, right? Um, it can also be associated with death, the mystery, or unknown. It's the color of grief or mourning. So um, that's kind of on the negative side, but it's certainly something that's used very frequently. White being the opposite. Purity, innocence, right? There's a reason a woman wears a white wedding dress when she gets married, right? It's, it's just ingrained into our culture, right? White can also be cold and distant. Uh, if you think of winter, cold, snow, that sort of thing um, as well. So let's look at the color emotion guide here, right? I think this is a great graphic, okay? So if we look at, right, we have the yellow and the optimism, right? And we can look at all the logos here that have decided to be in the optimism category. Right? And that's kind of interesting to see who picks being in that logo versus other. Right? We move down into the friendly or cheerful. Right? Uh, Amazon, good one. Hooters, you got to love it. Right? <laughs> I didn't make this graphic up. Um, you know, Firefox, we come down here. Right? A lot of sodas, that sort of thing. We move into the red realm. Right? Youthful, bold. Right? You see that there's a lot of, of um, Lego, right? Um, it's kind of you know big target that sort of thing. Excitement, no surprise. Okay. If we get into the creative, the purple, the 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 luxury, 
item, right? There's still a lot, but you get some surprises out there, like the Taco Bell purple logo, right? So why did they pick to be in that kind of creative realm? It's interesting, right? Maybe they just like the color, but it's also something to think about, right? The trust or the dependable. This one is, is very uh, interesting because you get a lot of the big companies, right? I mean, I guess Coca-Cola is a big company, but you get GE, Dell, AT&T, right? A lot of the big staple uh, companies are there. We get into the growth, right? John Deere was a very early green logo, but it's no surprising they were in farming. But as you move forward, there's a lot more that are falling under the green uh, logo, including like Starbucks, et cetera, right? And then we get into the balance, the blacks and the whites, right? Very iconic Nike, right? Black and white, Apple. So there's a fair number that are in that kind of iconic uh, colorless space. But it's still a very interesting way of looking at it, right? Oh, I, did, I didn't mention that we have the, the logos up at the upper end that are the rainbow logos, right? The Googles, the NBCs, Windows is also like that, Microsoft, et cetera. OK, so let's go back in time. Uh, there's, there's this great website called the Internet Time Machine. I don't know if you've ever seen this, where you can look at a snapshot of a website going way back in time. OK, so this is Yahoo in 1996. Right? There's probably some of you in here that weren't even born in 1996, which scares me. Right? Maybe you were all born. Okay? I definitely was. So um, this is kind of in the very early, early internet uh, world. Right? And so if we look at the color theory, there's not much color to it. Right? There's, the links are blue, right? and the Yahoo logo is red. Not a whole lot more available. So let's jump forward. Okay? Yahoo in the year 2000. Okay? Look at the huge emphasis on shopping, online shopping at that point. Okay? No surprise, green, money, there's an association. Right? So they switched that bar right, in the last one, right, which was kind of a grayish color. They switched that to be green to emphasize this money. Hey, it's good to, sorry, I'm going backwards here. It's good to spend money online, it's okay. Right? Let's go ahead and switch that so it's a subtle thing that happens. Right, let's jump forward a little bit. Right, you can see that it gets more and more cluttered. Right? This is the, the nature of Yahoo, which is why it's a good example. We're now in 2003. We're seeing the first bits of purple coming in, recognizing now Yahoo is entirely purple. Right? We'll get to that in just a second. Um, less emphasis on, the, um, on the, uh, the green, the online shopping. A little bit more emphasis on the purple. This is a good luxury you should be doing your searches with Yahoo, right? We move forward in 2005, right? We have the Valentine's Day ad, right? The passion, red, orange, right? Showing up there. Um, Yahoo is still in its red logo phase, right? We move forward and Yahoo in 2007 said, wait a minute, I want to be more like Google. I don't want my page to be quite as cluttered. Uh, and then we move forward. They say, ah, never mind. We want to go back to, back to the old way. Right, so we switch here, this is interesting, right? Between 2007 and 2009, we switch from the red Yahoo logo to the purple Yahoo logo, right? Same font, same logo, switch colors, right? Luxury brand, right? We've been around a long time. You wanna use us, you wanna have your email through, through us, right? And so we get a little bit more, um, it was certainly a better organization. Web search button turns yellow, right? As a way of drawing attention to that, that, that part of it. Right, we move forward to 2013, a right? lot more purple. Right? It's a little bit deeper color of purple, uh, but really emphasizing that, hey, this is our, this is our luxury brand. Okay? Now, let's, you know I couldn't resist doing Apple too. right? So let's go through Apple. Apple circa 1997 is pretty awful. <laughs> right? So um, hey, they were, picking, they were picking red, right? trying to kind of highlight themselves as innovative and new, right? But it really was pretty, pretty terrible, right? Rebranded, Steve Jobs comes back, Apple 1998, much simpler, right? We're, we have some black already introduced. That's a very stable thing that Apple has done along the way. Uh, and they're kind of, kind of highlighting things, right? We move forward, right? The Apple logo turns red, exciting, keep that going, right? But notice the primary thing in 2000, it's amazing that this was what computers looked like in 2000, right? The big thing that they were pushing was that Apple was the luxury brand, 
right? So what did they show on the home page? Purple computer, right? Purple luxury brand, right? We move forward into 2001. They moved more into the blue range because they wanted to be, um, they kind of reestablished themselves. Remember, uh, Apple almost died in 1997, right? Steve Jobs came back in 1998 and they resurrected themselves. So by 2001, they were feeling pretty good, right? Let's say we're, we're a nice, stable company again. We can shift more from the red into the blue, right? So we move forward into 2002. Amazing how chunky that laptop looks now. Right, compared to what we're used to, one gigahertz with super drive. Anyway, sorry, this kind of stuff is entertaining. Notice though, holiday gift guide in green. Spend your money here. Right? So all of these things are really subtle and they're pushing you in this direction. Right? 2004, iPods. Right? Guess what? iPod, luxury item, purple. Right? They did a big splash with orange too at the same time. It was orange and purple. But anyway, this one is the, the purple one, right? We move forward into 2006, right? Pushing this stability, right? Neutral company. They're, they're moving much more in this direction, right? Then we start to get a little bit more of the 3D look and a little bit of shine, the metallic influences. But again, now we're staying primarily in that gray tone, uh, the black and white, right? 2010. I love this, right? iPhones have changed so much, <laughs> yet we're so used to them, you know? It's just entertaining, right? Voice control, it's not even Siri, right? Then we move forward yet again, a little bit shinier, right? And it's, and it's the, look at that upper ribbon. We got a little bit more gloss to it, but again, almost entirely black and white, a little bit of blue splash in the screen, um, you know, not much there. Then we move to 2011. Big emphasis on iOS 7 coming out, which was the first time that they switched from that 3D view into the more flat view, uh, which is what we see today. Okay, I need to update. I need to put a few more on. Websites for more information, right, about color theory. Palatin is something we'll use today. Colored is also something we'll use today. Um, color lovers used to be really good, and it's kind of fallen off a bit, right? So let's talk about Charlie Harper and kind of give you an example. So Charlie Harper was an artist in the 50s, um, and he did these kinds of very iconic graphic pieces, right? They work incredibly well for basic shapes in Illustrator, right? So what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be looking through today and finding something that Charlie Harper did and then basing your own work on that, right? The key thing is that there's very few shadows. Everything is abstracted into basic shapes. We look at the birds, they're made up of a series of circles, right? The body is a circle, right? The wings are a larger circle, right? The head here is basically a square and a circle. This is a rectangle. It's all based on basic shapes, right? Generally, there's some kind of a pattern that's associated with repetition, right? Bold colors are very common, right? He tends to show movement with outlines. So in this case, we've got the hummingbird wings and it's just a fan of outlines. Right, that one's a little bit blurry. He does really like patterns. So in this case, we have the patterns of the circles. One of the heads becomes, one of the pattern becomes the head of the bird. More examples. But again, everything is flattened, okay? I think this one's particularly well done as the pond looking down, right? Again, no, no real depth perception, it's just overlapping pieces. In this instance, right, we have the rings that represent the circle. We have the little water bug that each has its own rings as well. We have the leaf in the center of the circle. Then we have the lily pads, and then below the lily pads, we have the little crab or, or lobster or whatever crawdad, uh, and then we have the fish. Right, so it's that overlapping um, series of layers that provide the overall look. Again, very, very geometric. Okay, so let's look at some student work, right, and what, what various people have done. 
again, it's a lot about patterns and repetition. All right, I think this one's particularly nicely done. Very simple, very clean, basic shapes, basic colors. Right, that's what we're going after. Right. This one is pretty good, except that he used the gradient on the fish, which I think is not something that Charlie Harper would have done. I think we would have kept it as a consistent. I think this is a great example of taking a Charlie Harper. He has uh, this exact motif. right? It was redrawn, and he added the little knife and the guy stabbing him in the back. Right? So it's just it's a subtle change. Right? Another really good example, this could have been done by Charlie Harper. Right? The mosquito, or um, the termites losing their wings. Right? You saw the raccoons earlier. This is a take on the raccoons with the, um, the barbecue. Right? Simple flamingo, but notice that the, the consistent shapes, right? the circles over and over again. Right? This one's a little bit beyond, but I think the pattern was really nicely done. Okay? So there is, of course, many, many more examples online that you can look at. Uh, kind of get uh, a sense for, for what works and what doesn't, and I encourage you to do that. So we're going to move uh, computers here, and I'm going to talk about color swatches. Okay, so we've talked so much uh, about color theory, and I think one of the things that is important to recognize is, is being consistent with colors in something like Illustrator or, or across the various Adobe platforms is really important. And in order to do that, we're going to concentrate on t today on something called color swatches. And all three of the big Adobe products, Photoshop, InDesign, and Illustrator, work with swatches. Um, and so we can, we can have these kind of established colors that we can then go back to and pick. It's kind of the same thing as setting up a character or a paragraph style in InDesign, where it's, it's a reusable thing. Um, and in the old days, you used to just write down information about a particular color. What was the CMYK values? And then you go back and enter it manually. It's a whole lot easier to just be able to pick a swatch. Uh, so we're going to start with, um, well, I'll go through part one. You're going to go through and browse for a Charlie Harper image that's your base image that you're going to work from. Um, and you're going to post it, a link to it, or, or the image itself so that you know which one you, you pick to use. Right? Uh, part two is what we're going to start with. It's going to dealing with swatches in Photoshop. So we will go back to Photoshop today briefly. Um, and to follow along with part two, we're going to do Photoshop 1.23 color swatches. Right? And so we're going to begin by going to the website called palatin.com. Right? And it, this, the website, if you're looking at your book, it, the website changed. Um, I think it used to be colorschemedesigner.com, and they changed it to palatin. Um, so things change over time. So here at the palatin website, if we start with our basic color, right, this monochromatic one color choice, Right, you can see that we get kind of a base purple, and then we get darker purples and lighter purples from this base purple. Right? We can click on this little wheel, and we can swing the colors around to get a variety of, of colors, depending on what color you were interested in. We can also click and move the relative lightness and darkness of the colors. Obviously, if they all go together, right, the color is almost identical. As we pull these apart, we get darker and lighter versions of the colors. Um, depending on what your particular interest is. So if we move forward here, we get analogous colors, which basically mean three colors that, whoops, sorry, three colors that are similar. So as I move through, let's say I pick red, right, I get red, but then I get orange and I get kind of a pink. Right, so those are analogous. The next one is called the triad, right, which is three colors. If you pick the primary color, you get a split complement of the complement color. Right, so a lot of times, if you don't want a direct complement or you want two colors to work together, this triad is a good strategy. Basically, if I were to pick blue, for example, I'm going to get kind of an orange and kind of a yellow. I, I can also choose to make these further or closer together, depending um, on what I want. Right, so green here, I'd get this pink and this orange. If I was over here in yellow, right, or in purple, for example, I get two different shades. One is a greenish yellow, one is a yellow yellow. Right? The next one here is a tetrad, right? which is basically uh, two opposing. Right? It's two complements that are, so you pick two that are analogous, and then they're, they're direct complements. Right? And we get the tetrad. Okay? 
So I'm going to stick with the triad for right now. Right? And let's see, I'll pick kind of this blue. Right, let's adjust this about like that. And so I'm getting from the blue, I'm getting a red and I'm getting a kind of a gold. Okay? So I'm going to come up here to the share palette icon here. Never mind. Um, they move stuff around on me. Tables and export. There we go. Right? I want to go to color swatches here. And I want to export as an ACO Photoshop file. Okay, and it's going to download this mypalette.aco. Okay, and it's in my downloads folder for right now. So now I'm going to jump back into Photoshop here. Right, and again, I'm following along with the exercise, um, excuse me, the Photoshop 1.23. Right, and so I've already exported the palette, right? And I'm going to go to Edit and then Preset Manager. So let me go back to Photoshop. I'm going to go to Edit, and I'll go to Preset Manager. Oh, I might have to have a document open first. Let me go to File New, and have a document open. And then I'll go to Edit, Presets, Preset Manager. OK, and so right here in the presets, I have brushes available, but I want to go to Swatches. Right, which brings up the swatches. And these are all swatches that have already been preloaded into Photoshop, but I want to load my own set. So I'm going to click on this load button. And when I click on the load button, I'll have to go find the downloaded set uh, that I just downloaded. So let me go to my downloads folder. And there it is as mypalette.aco. It's the one I just downloaded. And I'll go ahead and click on load. And we'll see that starting right here, right, I have my blue color, and then I go all the way through my pinkish red colors, and finally my goldish brown colors. Okay? So all of those have been loaded in. Right? If I were to say done right now, they'd be available to me under the swatches menu here at the bottom. Right? There they all are. But I'm going to go back to that preset manager. I'm going to go to presets, preset manager, and I'm going to specify swatches. And I'm going to click on the first one, and I'm going to hold down Shift and click on the last one. Right? And you can kind of see that they're all highlighted in blue right now. Right? I want to be able to save these as a, what's called an Adobe Swatch Exchange file. Right? And this will allow me to use this same set of swatches, not just in Photoshop, but in InDesign and in Illustrator. So I can use it in Photoshop, InDesign, and Illustrator. That's the advantage here. So once I've done that, I'm going to click on this little gear icon, right? And the natural thing would be to, uh, OK, good, they changed the option. I'm going to save swatches for exchange, right? And then we'll go ahead and put it on my flash drive. So let me go here, my flash drive. Oops, wrong class. Would help if I was at 135. All right, and we need a new file. So it'll be exercise 118. And I'll go ahead and call this um, my this is blue try. I cannot type today. And notice that it's saving as a format .ase. That's the Adobe Swatch Exchange format. That's what I'm going to save. So I'll go ahead and click on Save. Now I have these swatches saved in that Adobe Swatch Exchange on my flash drive, which is exactly what I want. Right? And so I've saved it on my resources folder. We're going to now jump over into the world of Illustrator. I'm going to show you how to load the swatches into Illustrator. Right? So once again, I'll go to File New. There it is. And I'm going to come over to my swatches, which are listed right here under Swatches. Make that a little bit bigger. I don't currently have my new swatches loaded, so I'm going to click on the little flyout menu, the triangle with the lines next to it. And I'm going to go to Open Swatch Library, Other Library. And now I'll go to my flash drive into today's folder. And there it is, the Adobe Swatch Exchange. And I can go ahead and say Open, and it will bring in, there's my blue triad, there's all of my colors. 
right? So the advantage here is that if I had a shape, right, and I wanted to fill it with any particular color, all I have to do is click on that color, and it will fill to that color. Now, as I continue and create more shapes, for example, right, I can click on any one of them and change the color. And because they were designed with one of these color theories, generally speaking, the colors go nicely together. Right? So these three colors, yeah, they work nicely together. Okay? Because they're, they're designed with one of these um, generators. So that's good. So I have the blue triad. That's my set of colors. Right? And we're going to reload that somewhere else. I just wanted to show you how they came in. Okay? I'm going to then try another website. Right? And this one is called colored.com and they, they created their website in the world of cutting out um, vowels. So it's C-O-L-R-D. So you cut out vowels. Uh, and this website is a little bit different. It generates colors based on images. Right? And so you can see a bunch of example palettes that people have loaded um, that create certain sets of colors. Right? We're going to go ahead and create our own. So I'm going to click on this Create button. Right? And we have the option to do a color, a palette, a gradient, or something called Image DNA. That's the one we're going to pick. Now, it would be very fitting if this decided not to work on me. There we go. So by default, it loads an image, right? But we want to load our own image. So I'm going to click on Open. And I'm going to pick on Upload here. You can pick any one of images that people have already uploaded. But I'm going to go ahead and upload one of my own. So I'll choose an image. Let me go to my flash drive. We have to go back in time a little bit. I'll pick something from Exercise 105, one of these. Right? Yeah, that's a very ugly set of colors. Let me open a different one. Let's try this one. Right, something like this. Okay? So what it's doing is it's picking from this image a set of colors. Right? I can choose whether I want three colors, five colors, or seven colors. Right? I could also choose if I wanted a specific color right, to be added. Okay? Once I'm done, right, I'm going to go ahead and click on Save. And it's going to allow me to download an Illustrator, a Photoshop, or a GIMP. I'm going to download the Illustrator file this time. All right, it's called MyColor.ai. And so now we're going to jump over into Illustrator. And just like I loaded this set, I'm going to go to this little fly out here, and I'm going to go to Open Swatch Library, Other Library, and I'm going to pick, oops, it was in the Downloads folder, sorry, the MyColor.ai, and now I get the blue and also the MyColor.ai. So I can pick the colors that are coming directly out of that image as a set of colors. Okay. So I have some flexibility here. Okay? So that carries us through. OK. So then we're going to go to part four. Right? And so part four, what I'm going to ask you to do is to actually confirm that you can apply these swatches. Okay? So in part four, You'll go to the actual uh, digital tool site, look at exercise 118, which is right here. And there's a bunch of AI files that are available for you um, pre-set up so that you can apply your swatches. So we need to know the number of swatches we have. Um, and so the one that I just did was seven swatches, so I'm going to download the seven. So I'll save the link as, and I'm going to put it in my 118 folder. Click Save. And the one before that. I think was 15 colors. Yeah, it was a triad, so it was 15. So I'll go ahead and right click on this one and save link as, and save it as the 15. OK, so back in Illustrator, we're going to open the file again. And I'm going to open up my 118 
and we're going to pick the 7. And so what this is is a series of 7 rectangles right? that I'll be able to apply swatches to. So I already opened up my swatches. If I hadn't opened them, right, I'd again go to the flyout menu. I'd go to open swatch library, other library. And then I'd open up my, my color. There it is. And then I'm going to select the first one and click on the first color. Select the second one, click on the second color. Select the third one, third color. Oops. That was only six colors, right? Let me go back and get the six color version. There are six colors. So I'm saving you. You don't actually have to create these on your own. Um, but this will confirm that you can, in fact, apply the swatches. So there it is. That's my set of colors. I'm going to go ahead and go to File, Save for Web. And we'll save it. A PNG is fine. Let me see. I want to make sure that I'm following exactly how I asked you to do it. Oh, I said to do file export instead. That's fine. We'll go to file export. Save this as a JPEG. Doesn't matter if you do the the um, save for web. That'll work fine. And I'll go ahead and click save. Um, and color mode again. There's an example of RGB or CMYK. It doesn't matter for what we're doing. I'm going to pick a size of 10, right, and a resolution of high. There we go. And I'll go ahead and click on OK, and it will save my file. All right, so now on the website, I'm going to create a new post. Let me go to New Post. All right, and I'm going to upload a featured image. As that set of swatches, and I'll go ahead and set featured image. And then I want to upload the actual Swatch exchange file. Let me go to upload. And no, oh, I didn't save it here. It's still in my downloads. And there it is. Let me go ahead and insert into post. And I'll have a link to it. Right, we'll format this up a little bit better. that. And then over here on the right side, of course, I'm going to categorize it as exercise 118. But if we scroll down here a little bit further, just like we did with the collage images, right, there's going to be something for swatches. Right? And this is where I can add a tag that would, that would describe this. So maybe we'll add blue or black, etc. Okay. Once it's done, I'll go ahead and click on Publish. And I will have done one of the um, posts for today. I think total I'm asking you for four posts, two swatches, one Charlie Harper, three swatches. It's two, one from the Palatin, one from uh, Colored.com, um, the Charlie Harper sample image, and the last one is the color palette you intend to use for your Charlie Harper image. Okay, which you're going to create on your own. Okay, so there'll be four total posts. I do want to po point out a few things about the swatches. If we go to the website and we go to resources and we click on swatches, you can see a whole bunch of swatches that have been uploaded um, over time. I have some that people tend to like to use. 
um, that are based on the Prismacolor markers. Um, some of them are a little bit more advanced than others. Some are just the basic colors, like the warm and cool grays that you can use. These would match up with your markers. But these architecturals, um, the Prismacolor markers here, this is designed for use in Illustrator. And I don't know whether you can see it here, but they actually have light and dark patches as if you were coloring it by hand with a marker. Right? So you could use these swatches to mimic what it would look like if you were hand coloring something. Right? Um, and so this works the same way if you download the architectural markers here and then open, go back to this file here. Let me go ahead and load. Let me open my swatch library, other library. Right. By the way, these only work in um, Illustrator. But now, if I were to pick one set of these, let's see if there's any that, that show up. Oh, I'm looking there. Yeah, there you go. You can see it in that dark. See how it has little marker streaks that are on it? Right? As if you were coloring with a marker. They will also be semi-transparent, so you can see as, as you color one over the other, some of it will bleed through. Right? These probably should be the opposite direction. And back like that. So you've got a little bit of that that shines through. If I were to pick a different color, right, you can see that those shine through a little bit differently. Right? So these are all the basic architectural set. They're not the, um, like the bright reds and greens and, and that sort of thing that are part of the Prismacolor set. Uh, but these swatches have worked really nicely for me over time, doing a little bit of background coloring on images and whatever. So they're available for you uh, if you want them. Okay? So I'd just like to point those out. Um, I don't think there's anything else. Are there any questions? No? The idea is that you'll get through the swatches quickly today uh, and that you'll have the bulk of the day to work on your Charlie Harper image. Right, that's the purpose.